No, you need to unmute. Right. Did anyone hear what I just said? Or? No. Because they're all silent. Okay. Can you hear me now? Excellent work. All right. So <laughs> I was just saying thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me to speak to the AHSA New South Wales tonight. Um, it's a great privilege and I just uh, was worrying that I might have been uh, overexposing myself uh, lately because I've done a few of these talks, but um, it's very gratifying to see so many people have come along. So I really thank you for, for doing that. Uh, for the Victorian people who are uh, CIHS members, uh, which there are neither a few here tonight, um, I did this uh, presentation of, uh, last year at the Airways Museum. So um, if you didn't see it, great. If you've seen it before, feel free to, to uh, go and do something else. Go and commiserate over Joe Biden or something. Um, Righty-ho. Just let me start this up. Always good to start at the start. Here we go. All right, so what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is the accident to or involving a DH-86, to Haviland DH-86, VHUSW, Uniform Zero Whiskey, or would have been something else back then, I suppose, um, but better known as Lapina, belonging to Hollyman's Airways. Now, this accident, as it turned out, really wasn't an accident, um, other than um, it was a, a unfortunately, uh, or the aircraft was unfortunately damaged in a um, precautionary landing. Um, but it came on the heels of some other problems with the DH-86s, which um, led to this, directly to this accident. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And also the bigger context of the history of the DH-86. And this particular accident actually had some fairly far reaching consequences, which I'll cover at the end. Um, the other thing, or the other part of this presentation is uh, a fairly remarkable series of photographs of the recovery of the airplane from Hunter Island where it made its forced landing. Um, these were uh, donated to the CIHS some years ago by uh, the relatives of um, a chap who was, um, Ron Larson, who was a, uh, a boy aeronautical engineer or apprentice uh, mechanic, I suppose he would have been then, and uh, later worked for the Department of Civil Aviation as an airworthiness inspector. And they show the recovery of the aeroplane, uh, as I said, quite a remarkable series of photos. So starting off with part one, we'll look at uh, what happened on Friday the 13th of December, 1935, perhaps an uh, ominous date. So Hollyman's Airways, uh, they were quite a decent concern uh, back then. Uh, they are a Tasmanian-based uh, shipping family who had established an airline. They could see the future. Um, and uh, they were operating services at this point between Tasmania and Victoria. The um, DH-86 Lapuna uh, took off from Launceston on a flight to uh, Melbourne. It, it uh, had a stop en route at uh, King Island, or was a planned stop at King Island, and then on to RIF Laverton because Essendon, which was Melbourne Airport, then was being resurfaced at the time, so they were using uh, Laverton. So, as I said, the aircraft was VHUSW Lapuna. At 9.15, it left Launceston. Uh, heading westbound along the north coast of Tasmania. The aircraft was uh, pretty full because of a shipping strike at the time, and so they had a lot of uh, freight and passengers uh, that couldn't go by, by ship, so they chose to go by air. Uh, the crew of the aircraft were the chief pilot, Captain Alec Bain, and uh, co-pilot uh, Desmond Ditchburn, and they had eight passengers on board. So just after 10.30 uh, in the morning, they passed Hunter Island, which you can see on this map of uh, northwestern Tasmania, just off the northwest coast of Tasmania. And just after they passed Hunter Island, Captain Bain noticed a gap 
between the base of the port outboard interplane strut and the fabric skin of the wing. Now, <clears throat> just to show you where that is, uh, this is a photograph looking out along the port wing of a DH-86. This is the outer interplane strut and this is the uh, strut fairing here, which is a light uh, gauge aluminium fairing. And uh, um, Alec Bain could see a gap appearing in here between the bottom of the fairing and the wing skin. And uh, he thought the strut had come off the, the spar of the wing. <clears throat> and uh, obviously that's probably not a good thing. <clears throat> uh, and so he was quite worried that the wing might uh, collapse at any, any moment. So they made it, decided on an immediate return to Launceston. They sent a message by radio. They were in radio contact uh, with Launceston Air Radio. They sent them a, a message um, telling them what had happened. Um, but as they came back past Hunter Island, uh, um, Bain thought that the problem seemed to be getting worse. And he decided to do a precautionary landing on Hunter Island. Um, so the precautionary landing they did was it went well, although Hunter Island, as we'll see in some of the photographs coming up, was, was very rugged. Um, it's it's uh, volcanic uh, origin and it's exposed to some pretty harsh weather coming in from the Southern Ocean. And uh, I tried to put it down in a what was later described as a pocket handkerchief sized paddock. Um, and everything went fine until the right, or the uh, yeah, the, the starboard tire punctured and that caused the wing to dig into the ground and, and the airplane to spin around and so the, some of the wing, uh, the wing suffered some damage. So there's a photograph of Lapina on Hunter Island. Uh, we're looking at the port wing and as you can see here, I hope you can all see my cursor. Uh, the uh, fairing is missing here and this, this picture has been taken off but it was there at the time because uh, when they, oh, I should say, um, despite the fact that the aeroplane had, had ground looped and, and suffered some damage, all the passengers and crew were unharmed so they, they were pretty lucky um, and I guess it was a pretty skillful um, forced landing. So after they got out of the aircraft, obviously Bain and uh, Ditchburn were keen to have a look at the wing and see what the problem was and they went and had a look uh, and you can see here that, in fact, the strut is still firmly attached to the lower wing. Um, and what they discovered was that the, the light metal fairing had come adrift and it was moving up and down and creating the impression of a gap between the strut and the wing. So, in fact, there had been nothing structurally wrong with the aeroplane. Now, you might think, well, why did Bone panic? Oh, I'll just show you another photograph. This is the other side of the aeroplane. So you can see the starboard undercarriage has collapsed and there's some damage here in the between the engines where the wings buckle. So why did, um, why did Maine make a precipitous decision to, uh, to uh, put his aeroplane down on, on such a rugged uh, uh, bit of land instead of perhaps trying to go and land at Smithton where there was an aerodrome? which was the, near, the nearest aerodrome. So we'll come to, to why that was the case in, in a minute. To understand that, we need to look at what came before this accident in the history of the DH-86 in Australia. And we're going to look at the period 1934, 1935. So this is uh, 1935, uh, this accident. Uh, at the end of 1935. So there'd been basically two years of, of uh, history before that. So going back to the start, the DH-86 had been designed for Qantas, basically for the, the new international service that was going to open up. Qantas were going to operate from Brisbane up to Singapore to join with the Imperial Airways uh, air service to a motherland, as most white Australians thought of it in those days. Um, and uh, Qantas had basically, or uh, Qantas and the Department of Civil Aviation who were leading the contract for that service had, had come up with a specification for an aircraft. One of the key features was that it had to have multi, multiple engines, preferably four engines, um, for reliability over the Timor Sea, which was 
been uh, considered a fairly lengthy stretch of open water. Um, so the specification was given to de Havilland, who were one of the premier aeroplane designers in the UK at that time, or civil aircraft designers anyway. And uh, they came up with the uh, DH-86. So Qantas ordered five of those aircraft off the drawing board. Um, but the aeroplane seemed to be quite a promising design and Holliman's Airways also decided to order it off the drawing board, as did uh, Railway Air Services, a UK operator. Now, as it turned out, <coughs> um, Qantas weren't the first operator in Australia. They, they was sent Lester Brain, who was the chief pilot, over to the UK to do some acceptance uh, testing on the aircraft. And the aircraft had originally been designed, as you can see in this ad here, uh, this was for an Imperial Airways uh, um, aircraft, but uh, you can see it's got a single pilot nose, quite a different shape to the, the one you can see on the right there, which is a Qantas aircraft. And Brain realised fairly quickly that a single pilot um, aeroplane wasn't going to cut it on the long route to Singapore. They needed to have two pilots so that they could share the flying. And also um, uh, one of the pilots would be the radio operator as well. So they said to De Havilland, basically, you know, you need to redesign the aeroplane with, with a two pilot cockpit, which De Havilland agreed to do. Um, but while that was going on, Holliman's had already ordered uh, a couple of DH-86s and the first one that they got had a single pilot uh, nose. So just to show you, this is the cabin of one of the Polyman's um, DH-86s. So they considered quite um, uh, luxurious aeroplanes uh, for the day. Um, and uh, you can see this one here has got the twin yokes of a, a two-seat aircraft, which Solomon's did uh, later on get. So the first aircraft was the HURN, which they christened as <coughs> Miss Hobart. And unfortunately, just 16 days after it entered service in October 1934, the aircraft disappeared off Wilson's Promontory. Now, this photograph, which I believe is an original photograph, it was probably hand coloured, but um, an original photograph nevertheless, shows the aircraft. You can see it's got the distinctive single pilot nose. And this is Redondo Island, which is an island just down off Wilson's Prom, quite ironically. Now, the aeroplane disappeared. I think uh, they only found a few small parts uh, of it floating sort of got washed up on the beach. So there was nothing really to indicate what had happened to the uh, aircraft. So they had an investigation, but because there was no evidence that they couldn't really pin it down. So there were various theories. One of them was that um, uh, the two pilots were, were changing seats. So they had two pilots on board, uh, Gilbert Jenkins, who was the chief pilot at the time for uh, Hollyman's. And um, oh, I've forgotten his name, the, uh, one of the Holliman uh, brothers, who was the, uh, Victor Holliman, who was the, sort of the aviation interested, uh, one of the Holliman brothers. Um, he was also a pilot, um, although he wasn't qualified in the DH-86. And they think that uh, Jenkins and Holliman may have been switching positions and they accidentally uh, snagged one of the controls or something like that and the aircraft uh, crashed because of that. But as I say, there was no evidence really to, it was just a theory, there's no evidence to prove it. So that, that was a pretty shocking loss. I mean, 16 days into service, uh, not very good. Um, but, you know, it could have just been one of those things. The problem was that very shortly afterwards, another DH-86 crashed in Australia. Now, as I said, Qantas had ordered five DH-86s. These were delayed in the UK, uh, uh, pending um, the redesign by de Havilland. So uh, just as Hollyman's put their first DH-86 into service, Qantas ferried out, or actually Imperial Airways ferried out the first of the Qantas DH-86s. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll lead you astray there. Lester Brain, who uh, had already fer ferried out one of the Qantas DH-86s, and that was up at Archerfield, they were using it for training and so on. Um, the next uh, two D 
DH-86s were put on a ship to come out to Australia. The one after that was retained by de Havilland to do some more flight testing because Qantas had asked them to put flaps on the aeroplane um, to make it more suited to small aerodromes. Uh, so they needed the, to, in the UK, to, to modify and test. And so it was actually the fifth aeroplane that Imperial Airways ferried out to Australia. And so it was an Imperial Airways crew ferrying out to VHUSG when it crashed um, shortly after takeoff from Longreach on the 13th of November 1934. So just a month after the, the Hollyman's uh, DH-86 had disappeared. Now, this is a photograph of USG at, at Longreach and you can see, see how the fuselage has been squashed flat. Um, the aeroplane was observed to spin into the ground in a, a flat spin. And one of the crucial uh, bits of evidence you can see just here by the rear fuselage is an engine. This was a spare Gypsy 6 engine that they were carrying in the rear fuselage in the in the cabin. Uh, and uh, that's been slung out of the fuselage in the, the accident. And you can also see here the, the fin. So this is the rudder. And this, this thing here is the fin. You can see how it's come adrift from its mounting at the front of the tail plane here and, and flopped over sideways. So um, when the uh, wreckage was inspected. The first thing that uh, they thought, because it had spun in and because the tail was damaged, they thought perhaps the tail had failed in flight. Um, they did quite extensive uh, testing on it and decided that in fact it hadn't uh, come adrift, uh, but that was one of the things they looked at. What doesn't seem to really got any proper attention at the time was the fact that when Lester Brain had ferried out the first aircraft a couple of months earlier, um, he had had an experience climbing out of, uh, I think it might have been Tobruk, perhaps in uh, Africa, or it might have been Benghazi, I can't remember, somewhere in Africa anyway. They took off um, early in the morning. After they got airborne, uh, Brain had handed over control to his co-pilot, who was an Imperial Airways chap who was just there for the ferry flight. And he'd gone back down the cabin to use the toilet, which was located right down the, the aft end of the aeroplane. And Brain was in the toilet and he felt the aeroplane lurch and quickly, I guess, pulling his trousers up and running up to the front of the aeroplane. He, he saw the aeroplane was sort of rolling into a, an incipient spin and he was able to uh, correct it and uh, recover the aircraft. But he had a strong suspicion then that the center of gravity for the airplane um, and the design of the aircraft meant that it was um, directionally unstable and that uh, with an aft CFG, it was susceptible to going into a spin. But so even though he'd experienced that, he didn't quite go, sorry, when, when Brain heard about the accident to USG at Longreach, one of the first things he asked was, where were the crew in the aeroplane? Where were they found? And it turned out that the co-pilot and the engineer, flight engineer that they were carrying, were sitting in the two control seats. And the captain, the Imperial Airways captain, was found in the toilet at the back of the aeroplane. And Brain put two and two together and said, oh, this is probably what happened. They had the same problem we had. But nobody seems to have really listened to him at that point about that, that issue and realise that the aeroplane was um, probably directionally unstable. However, the um, Air Accidents Investigation uh, Commission in Australia um, commissioned some flight testing using one of the other Qantas aircraft. And those flight tests did show that the aeroplane did have directional stability problems. Um, they also looked at a huge range of other issues with the aeroplane, there were some problems with the, the structure of the tailplane and the way it was designed, particularly with the, um, the uh, elevated trimming uh, gear, which was on a um, screw jack. Uh, and, sorry, not the uh, elevator, the uh, rudder. Uh, had a rudder trim was done by biasing the rudder and that was on a screw jack and it could distort the, the uh, frame of the aircraft because uh, it wasn't very well designed. And so they, they couldn't prove what had happened to the aeroplane, so they basically came up with a, a shotgun series of modifications to the aircraft 
one of which was sealing the rudder servo. Um, so the, the rudder was at a servo tab to operate it and uh, sealing the gap between the rudder and the servo tab seemed to improve the directional stability problem uh, of the aircraft. So uh, they couldn't actually pin down exactly what had happened. So they, they modified the airplane in various ways and, and hoped that it was good enough or that it had fixed the problem. So what I haven't really mentioned um, going back a step is that in terms of the certification of, of airplanes back in those days, particularly uh, airline airliners, um, in the UK, the practice was the manufacturer would build a prototype. They would do their own flight testing. And when they were happy with the way the airplane flew, they would then give it to the air ministry who would commission further flight testing at the airplane and armament experimental establishment at Martel, which was at Martlesham Heath back then. Um, the RAF pilots at the ANAEE would do a series of flight testing, uh, flight tests, write up a report, and then recommend the airplane to be given a, a type certificate. <clears throat> and that's exactly what happened with the DH-86. Now, the interesting thing is the DH-86 flight test program took two weeks from the time the airplane first flew to the time it was given a CMA. Now, <clears throat> we would look at that today and go, that's absolutely ridiculous. You cannot possibly test an airplane, particularly you know, a, a major type like a four engine airliner in two weeks, but they were absolutely pressed to the deadline for starting the International Air Service at the end of 1934. And de Havilland rushed it through and the British authorities seemed to have also rushed that through, um, but obviously with consequences uh, later on. So that was the story. Qantas put the DH-86s into service um, eventually. Or I should say when the uh, USG crashed at Longreach, the Australian Department of Civil Aviation also seemed to have been a bit reluctant to intervene too dramatically. So they, they could have suspended the aircraft's type certificate in Australia, but they didn't. Um, instead, they reached an agreement with Qantas that Qantas wouldn't fly the airplanes on commercial services until such time as the department uh, gave them the okay. And that's why in December 1934, the International Air Service actually op opened using a DH-50 and a DH-61 flying out of Archerfield and not a DH-86. And in fact, Qantas weren't able to use the DH-86 till I think it was February the following year when the department uh, finally decided that they'd, they'd modified the aircraft enough and it was okay to use. So they operated for about a year. Uh, Hollyman's got some a replacement aircraft, which was, uh, as you can see here, one with a, a two pilot nose. And uh, Qantas, um, they didn't get a replacement for the one that crashed, but they had their, their four other aircraft uh, and they were able to operate them quite successfully over that period. But on the 2nd of October, 1935, about a year after the first accident, um, Hollyman's Airways, Hollyman's Airways other DH-86 BHURT liner uh, crashed into the sea on approach to Flinders Island. Now, once again, the aircraft was seen to do what looked like a spin into the sea, although it wasn't actually seen to crash. Um, they did an extensive search for wreckage and uh, were able to pull up uh, bits of the aircraft or recover bits of wreckage floating, but not um, the main structure of the aircraft. So once again, the authorities were left kind of guessing about what the cause of the accident was. But um, it was quite a shocking thing. So now we'd had three DH-86 accidents in Australia in the space of a year. Um, so the Civil Aviation Branch um, convened what they called a conference of experts. Um, they got uh, people from academia, from the CAB itself, from the RAAF, um, all well-respected uh, people in uh, the aeronautical uh, field, oh, and also people from the industry. They had people from Hollyman's and from Qantas as operators of the type. And the idea was to put, form this uh, panel to go over all of the issues that had been uncovered with a fine tooth comb to try and find out um, what was wrong with the airplane. 
Um, as a part of that process, they commissioned some wind tunnel testing with models of the aircraft. And uh, so this would have been some of the very first um, wind tunnel testing done in Australia. Uh, and also uh, they did uh, commission flight testing uh, as well. Ironically, the aircraft they used to do the flight testing was Lapina. And this photograph here, which I, I used earlier, but um, this photograph is actually taken during that uh, flight test program, um, was taken with cameras mounted in the fuselage of the aircraft and looking out along the wings. And you can see on the struts, we've got um, graduations here so that they could measure deflections. And down here, they've got a quadrant to measure aileron deflection. Um, so they had still cameras and movie cameras um, recording all of this. And uh, one of the suspicions was um, the fact that the DH-86 had a an innovative type of wing design was a single main spar without a rear spar. And that's why you can see there's only one strut on the outer wing panel there. There's only a single spar going through there. Uh, and there was a thought that because of that design that at high speeds, the wing might start to twist. Um, I don't think there was any thought that the wing would actually disintegrate, but the thought was that if the wing twisted, you could suffer aileron reversal at a certain speed, and then that would lose, lead to a loss of control, and that might have led to the, the accidents. And Gordon Berg, who was the chief uh, airworthiness engineer for the CAB, was, was a very strong uh, proponent of that particular theory. Um, so they did this testing, and part of it was they, they operated the aeroplane that caught high speeds, and then they introduced um, uh, aileron um, inputs, and they were looking to see whether the wing uh, would twist uh, because of that. And anyway, they, they proved that it, it, it wasn't really an issue. However, um, one of the things they did discover was, um, well, they decided there weren't any immediate airworthiness problems that they could find. And, um, they did note, though, that there was, the aircraft had an exceedingly violent stall and uh, could easily slip into an incipient spin. Now, part of the certification testing for aircraft of this type didn't include spin testing. Um, so the aircraft was not designed to be spun. Um, so it had never been tested in, in that regime. Um, so that was a bit of an open sort of question mark at that time. So we're going to leave that airworthiness stuff there for the moment and have a look at the salvage operation which occurred while all of this was going on. So in January, February of 1936. So Matthews, uh, sorry, uh, Hollyman's Airways actually had only partly insured the aeroplane and, and uh, they thought the cost of recovering it from Hunter Island was going to be so great that uh, it would be uneconomical. They were just going to leave the aeroplane there, or at least they were thinking about doing that. But their insurers, uh, the British Aviation Insurance Company, decided, no, we're going to recover it and rebuild it. So the insurance company contracted Matthews Aviation, and, um, uh, an operator at uh, Essendon Airport, quite well known in, in the day, uh, to go and salvage the aircraft. So this photograph here is quite a historic one. We've got on the left is Horace Brinsmaid, who was the first controller of civil aviation. Uh, Scotty Allen here uh, in his uh, guise as a pilot for, whoops, what happened there? Uh, guise as a pilot for Australia National Airways. Um, this chap here on third from the left is Skipper Matthews. He was the chap who uh, owned Matthews Aviation. And on the right is a. Murray Jones, who was um, at the time the superintendent of aircraft for the Department of uh, for the CAB, but later on went to De Havilland, uh, Australia as the, the manager. And he had a hand in the DH-86 story as well. Okay, so these are Ron Larson's photos. Ron was a, a boy apprentice with um, Matthews at the time, just starting out, I think he was 14 or something. Um, and he uh, took his camera with him to Hunter Island as they went to salvage the aeroplane. So these are quite a, a, a remarkable series of photos, as I've said before. So the first job they did 
was to remove the engines from the aircraft and you can see them um, starting to do that there. The propellers have been removed already. They had no machinery at all and uh, we'll show you a bit later on uh, the difficulty they had to get any tools up to the aircraft. Um, so basically they had to, they could only use what they could carry with them. So they've set up a shear leg here with pulleys and so on to lower the engines uh, out of the aircraft. No OHS and uh, OHS stuff in those days. Just climb up on the wing and get on with it. This the next step was uh, dismantling the wings. You can see the port outer wing, outer upper wing has been removed, and uh, this chap here with the hammer seems to be about to start work on the lower wing. You can see some buckling in here too, and in, in towards the centre section. <coughs> Here's uh, some of the chaps um, with various bits and pieces removed from the aircraft. I think this might be uh, down towards the beach where they had to, to carry everything. So you can only get to the aeroplane either, um, there was space to land a light aircraft on Hunter Island. And in fact, um, a couple of aircraft had gone to the site early on in the piece. Um, but, uh, for heavy, for shifting heavy gear, the only way you could get stuff on and off the island was by ship. So they had to, they chartered a catch called the Lita May, uh, and they used it to bring the, the chaps and their equipment to the island, and then they were using it to remove the bits of the aeroplane. So up here we've got bits of uh, aluminium uh, sheet metal work, so cowlings and things like that. There's an engine, you can see they've taken the, the cylinders off it, uh, probably to reduce the weight. There's another bit of cowling, there's a nose bowl for the, the engine and so on. Um, this is a photograph on the beach. This is, I think, uh, the stuff that they brought in to help them dismantle the aeroplane. The, the bits of, I don't know, I guess that's probably water or something maybe. Um, you can see it's, the box here is addressed to Matthews Hunter. Uh, and these wheels were for a cart, which we'll see in a minute that they, and, and for a dolly to, to actually move the aeroplane. So this is the, the kind of terrain that they had to work through. It was very, very thick scrub. There's a couple of these young lads here with a, a box slung on a pole. Uh, so everything had to be manhandled in and out of the, the accident site. Uh, here are the chaps uh, with one of the engines. They've made a little hand cart. And there's the engine lying on its side with some bits of cowling and so on tied to the top. So um, this area is, I believe this is around the aeroplane. You can see it's a little bit more open and, and less uh, sort of rugged than the, the terrain we were looking at before. So here's the, another stage of uh, dismantling the aeroplane. You can see they didn't take a lot of care with <laughs> some of what they were doing. Um, so the starboard wing's pretty much gone completely, the port wing's still in place at this stage. And here's the port wing gone now, and the very front of the nose as well has been removed. And when they got it down to just the fuselage, they put these little dolly wheels on, on the uh, centre section extensions and hand dragged the aeroplane through the scrub to the beach. Now you can imagine how much fun that would have been. Here they are. And this photograph, I believe this is the Lita May, um, looking at it from the cliff top. So everything, when they got it to the, the cliff top, they had to lower everything down to the beach. And then to get it out to the uh, boat, they had to uh, float either the small bits, obviously they could put in a boat and row them out. Um, the larger bits they had to float out on um, drums and things like that. So it was quite a rigmarole to recover the aeroplane. So that's the recovery process. And um, we've talked about some of the airworthiness issues that were bubbling away at the same time. So now let's look at how all of this played out. As for the aeroplane itself, the issue is looking spick and span. 1936, so the aeroplane crashed at the end of 1935. 
um, it was re taken back to Melbourne in early 36, uh, rebuilt. Uh, and then when Hollyman's became Australian National Airways, uh, their airplane transferred to uh, ANO. So you can see here, it's this is probably when it was brand new. Still got the Hollyman's Airways uh, flag on the tail there. In 1940, it was impressed into the RIF as A31-4, served in Australia uh, for a while, till 1942, when the aircraft was temporarily leased to Qantas as back in its own original guise as VHUSW. And it was used to replace uh, one of Qantas's DH-86s that had crashed on takeoff from Archerfield in uh, February uh, 1942. So Qantas was still using, uh, I can't remember, it was one DH-86, maybe two, on their um, internal services in Queensland at the time, because uh, obviously they'd gone to the Empire flying boats by then for the international service, or that had been suspended during the war. Uh, but they still retained one of their DH-86s. At the end of the war, the aeroplane was purchased from disposals by McRobertson Miller Airlines over in WA. Uh, they seem to have used it for a while, but it can't have been in very good condition because in 1946, it was sold in the UK uh, and they had a crew to ferry it to the UK, um, but the, the crew abandoned the airplane at Allahabad in India on its delivery flight and the airplane was just left to rot. It was in that bad a condition that the crew refused to fly any further. So the ignominious end for the poor old girl. Now, going back to the airworthiness issues, the Civil Aviation Branch had some history over airworthiness issues with the UK Air Ministry and de Havilland's prior to the DH-86. And that concerned the saga of the DH-80 Pussmoth, um, which had been a problem in 1930 through to 32. So I'm not going to go into detail about that, but um, a couple of, uh, well, Pussmoss had crashed in Australia with uh, after a wing failure. Um, the Australian DCA suspended the type certificate for the aeroplane. It caused an uproar in the UK because how could these colonials upstarts, um, you know, doubt our airworthiness qualifications? Um, but uh, eventually the aeroplane was restored uh, the CBA was restored, I should say, but then there were some more uh, structural failures of puss moths in other parts of the world. There was at least one in South Africa, I think, and then another one involving this aircraft, UPM, in, in Australia. Um, so the Australian Department of Civil Aviation, or Civil Aviation Branch, Department of Civil Aviation, eventually mandated a number of modifications to the puss moth that involved fitting uh, extra jury struts into uh, the wings, this one here you can see, and then after the war, uh, they had another accident. Oh, sorry about that. They had another pussmouth accident involving a wing failure, and uh, they mandated the fitting of this rather large strut uh, at the front of the wing to control the torsional flexing of the wing and, and uh, flutter at high speed. So. There had been a big fight over the DH-86, uh, sorry, DH-80 airworthiness problems, because as I said, the, the British were quite resentful of uh, the colonials telling them how to do airworthiness. Um, and of course, the Australian people were equally resentful of not being listened to by the, the British authorities and, and uh, what they perceived as the arrogance of, of both the UK Air Ministry and de Havilland, the manufacturer. So that was in the background when the whole DH-86 saga kicked off as well. So looking at a bit of a timeline of what happened after the Lepina accident. So on the 13th of December, uh, the Lepina had its force landing on Hunter Island. Um, the news quickly reached the Civil Aviation Branch in Melbourne. Uh, the controller of civil aviation, who was Edgar Johnston by that time, had a quick conference with the minister, who was uh, Archdale Parkhill, I think, and uh, almost immediately announced that the Australian DH-86 certificates of airworthiness would all be suspended. So remember, this was the second time now that they were suspending, or that they'd stopped the aeroplane from flying. They hadn't suspended its CBA the first time. 
but now they thought they had some good grounds. This was when they everybody thought that the wing had come apart in flight, uh, and they hadn't got the news that it, would, it was only the fairy. Um, as soon as they did get a report from uh, the accident site that that the uh, that it, the wing hadn't failed, um, they lifted the suspension, the CBA suspension. So three days later. Uh, after the Air Accidents Investigation Committee had um, sent them an interim uh, report. But the fact that that had occurred created a huge furor in the UK. So de Havilland particularly were very incensed, once again, that these upstart colonials had dared to question their airworthiness um, cre uh, credibility. And uh, the various British politicians and members of the industry over there uh, were very upset because they they thought that this was an affront to British technology and they were hoping to sell aeroplanes all around the world. And of course, if there was a question mark over the airworthiness of the type, then that probably wouldn't go down too well. So there was a huge carry on in the background, a political carry on about the fact that Australia has, has suspended the CFA and particularly after it became apparent that there hadn't really been a good reason for it that they'd suspended it in a bit of a hurry. However, what you've got to really remember is that this was not the first DH-86 accident. This was the end of, or well, they had three previous accidents that were genuine aircraft losses. So the, the Australian authorities were pretty gun shy when, when the news came of this one. Funnily enough, the AISC submitted its final report a day later. Uh, and uh, basically said, well, nothing to see here. <clears throat> in January, at the end of January, the salvage of Lapuna commenced on Hunter Island, which we've already looked at. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, Gordon Berg sent a report uh, or submitted a comprehensive report on the airworthiness of the DH-86, and he, he covered all of the issues that had been looked at before and the history of what had been done. Um, and he was he was still actually quite concerned about the wing structure of the aeroplane, even though it had been shown in this case that it wasn't at fault. So the conference of aeronautical experts reconvened at uh, Victoria Barracks, and of course they they had the uh, flight testing uh, results, so they looked at that. And um, Gordon Berg pushed quite hard for modifications to the wing structure. But um, the industry people, particularly on the um, uh, the panel, uh, pushed that pushed back on that because they said it would be a huge expense. It would be a unique uh, modification, and, and really there wasn't any evidence to show uh, that it was necessary. Um, so on the twenty second of February, the final parts of Lapona recovered from Hunter Island. So basically, it took a month to recover the aeroplane. One of the things that the Conference of Aeronautical Experts did resolve was to send Gordon Bird to the UK, which he, he did do in, the, in March that year. Um, and uh, a big part of his mission was to communicate the results of the Australian flight testing that they'd done and the various deliberations that um, the Australians had done on DH-86 airworthiness. Now, Berg uh, seems to have got a very cold reception in the UK to his um, uh, to his information and which there was some there was some good solid information in what he was conveying but uh, it wasn't well received at all by the air ministry or by de Havilland's and, and he came home very despondent uh, thinking that nobody had uh, paid any attention to what he had to say however um, in the background and unbeknown to the Australian authorities, the UK authorities were grappling with some DH-86 problems of their own. Um, in August of 1936, so this is actually after Berg's visit, but um, none of this seems to have been conveyed to the Australian authorities. So in August 1936, the British Airways DH-86 uh, was on a mail flight from Germany to the UK and for reasons that weren't explained and couldn't be determined, the aircraft went out of control in cruising flight uh, and crashed in Germany. Now, looking back at it, we might think that perhaps 
the pilot had gone back to use the toilet or something like that. Um, but uh, they weren't able to determine. But all they knew was that the airplane had gone out of control in flight. Um, a month later, another DH-86 crashed in the UK uh, on a night takeoff at Gatwick and incidentally killing the chief pilot of British Airways. So this couple of chief pilots had uh, at their end in DH-86 is not a good look. Um, this really seems to have spurred the British authorities into taking the whole DH-86 airworthiness thing um, seriously. And uh, remember, I said, none of this has, seems to have been communicated to the Australian authorities. So they were, they were keeping the Australian people uh, out of the loop on, on what was going on. Um, the British ministry ordered the flight testing of every DH-86 on the British register which they, they got the ANAE to do at, at Martlesham. And uh, I'll just uh, read you the results. Seven were found to be unsafe and no further flying of these aircraft was permitted. While the remainder, nine in all, were considered to be sufficiently safe to continue flying, but under quite restrictive conditions, including no night flying. Now, if that's not a damning indictment of the airworthiness of the aircraft, uh, I don't know what is. Um, in the UK, the de Havilland's uh, later on modified the uh, further production of DH-86s with these, uh, to produce the DH-86B um, with these um, additional finlets on the ends of the tarpaulin. And that seems to have finally cured the directional stability problems of the aircraft. So the DH-86Bs seem to have been a much better and much safer um, aircraft than the earlier DH-86s, but uh, there was a DH-86B, Carpenters had one in Australia um, that had the fins, but the older ones were never uh, required to be retrofitted with these uh, fin extensions. <clears throat> so in the UK, just let me go back. So in the UK, um, the, the DH-86s and DH-86As on the UK register were required to be modified. So the next part of the saga, and this is where the consequences start to, to flow a bit further. Um, in 1936, the Department of Defence uh, reversed its operation. So I think I should say Department of Civil Aviation there. Uh, no, I'll take that back. It was the Department of Defence because it was the Civil Aviation branch of the Department of Defence and the RIF. Uh, so both of those branches of, or parts of the Department of Defence had opposed the use of flying boats for the Empire Airmail scheme for reasons which I won't go into here, uh, but they reversed their opposition to the use of those flying boats. However, one of the consequences of what had gone before with the DH-86 and the Puss Moths was that the Civil Aviation Board, as it became by then, um, were very cautious about the airworthiness arrangements for the Empire flying boats. Now, that's a whole another topic I can talk at length about, but I, so I won't bore you with it right now. But suffice to say that these lingering problems that, that had... Um, these lingering problems that, that had... Um, oops, sorry, I can hear an echo there. These lingering problems with the uh, DH-86 and the Pussy Moth... Sorry, the Empire Flying Boats. Sorry, I can hear an echo there. consequence of the Lapina accident that also had very far-reaching um, uh, well had very far-reaching consequences so while Lapina was still stuck on Hunter Island in December 1935 uh, the Australian government had reversed its uh, ban on the import of um, airliners from America from the USA uh, partly at, um, uh, thanks to the lobbying by Edgar Johnston, the, the uh, controller of civil aviation, and also um, uh, people from the industry. And Hollyman's announced on 28th of December 1935 their first Douglas DC-2 purchase, and they were going to use that on the Bass Strait service. So they were going to replace the DH-86s, which, of course, they had a fairly sorry history with by then. Uh, with these new all-metal, much more powerful, much more comfortable 
comfortable aircraft and faster from the USI. In, on the 5th of May 1936, uh, so not that long after, just after Lapuna had been recovered from Hunter Island, the first DC-2, uh, the Bungana entered service with uh, Australian National Airways. And this can be considered to mark a fundamental turn away from the British Empire for Australia's airliner purchases. And in fact, um, there wasn't a major airliner purchased again from the British airliner uh, up until today, uh, from, from Britain, I should say. So we've, we do have uh, Airbuses, which are partly made in Britain. We've had a few things like ambassadors and so on that were made in the UK, but by and large, the Australian airlines turned away from Britain towards America for the purchase of their airliners for the next 60, 70 years. So it had a huge uh, consequence uh, in terms of the airplanes that were used in Australia. And that pretty much brings me to the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I think uh, everyone's still muted there. How about the Vickers Viscounts? We've got quite a few of them. Oh, that's right. The Vicants, you're right. Oh, that's right. The Vicants, you're right. Oh, that's right. The Vicants. Oh, that's right. The Vicants. Vicants is probably more of an exception rather than the rule. That's true. And Darwin Heron. Yeah, would you really call them major airliners? Conair, dude. Bushies, dude, I think. Uh, I'm not saying there weren't any, but they were, certainly weren't used as trunk airliners. Oh, agreed. Yeah, no. The Viscount, yeah. Bill, would you care to comment on the uh, uh, impact of all this on the Australian government, especially in terms of the pressure that it was under to allow the Dutch to fly to Australia? Um, look, I don't know that there is any connection between the the DH-86 airworthiness issues and, and the Dutch flying to Australia and all. Um, <clears throat> the Dutch were obviously pressing to be allowed to fly into Australia, but it was more, as, as you know, the, the trade-off to allow the flying boats to operate through the Netherlands East Indies that finally caused the yes. uh, Australian and British governments to allow them to come here. Yes. Uh, I believe another DH 86 of kind of sprang near Archerfield. I was trying to say that no, wasn't any word in problem, but I think I found the, the rudder some fair distance from the rest of the airframe. Yeah, so that was another one uh, that uh, crashed out of control after takeoff. Um, it had gone into a, well, I thought it had gone into a thunderstorm, but I don't know that that was ever proven. But I think there's a pretty good chance that that was also a loss of control due to directional stability problems. Uh, and that was the one that I was referring to um, that Lapuna was taken back out of the um, the Air Force for during the war to replace that aircraft. With the one that crashed on, a on its way out to be delivered, your photo showed that they'd been also carrying an, an engine aboard and that looked to have been at more at the rear of the plane. Did that have any impact? Mm. Um, look, it wouldn't have helped with the center of gravity. Mm. Um, in fact, um, Lester Brain had exactly the same problem when he ferried the first one out. They had a spare engine in the back of that. And when he took off in the UK from, uh, I've forgotten where he took off from, I don't think it was Hatfield, but anyway, um, he found the airplane was almost uncontrollable because the center of gravity was so far aft. And, um, he worked out that they had actually miscalculated the center of gravity position in the, actually on the, on the loading diagrams that they were using for the aircraft. Um, I think they had the wrong moment arm for part of it. So the airplane had been misloaded with a way aft CFG, which obviously didn't help. 
but they they landed in France and they they restowed everything with the CFG much further forward. But they still had that problem coming out of oh, it was Tripoli, sorry, uh, just remembered um, climbing out of Tripoli uh, when Lester Brown went down the back. His weight down the back uh, was enough to cause the aircraft to go out of control. I'm just looking at some of the things people have put online here. Uh, there was Sid Marshall's hangar. Um, somebody asked. Uh, Roderick, you asked about a DH-86 that went down in New South Wales uh, three years ago. It was actually a DH-84 Dragon and it crashed in Queensland. Ah. And that was a VFR flight into IMC, unfortunately. Was UXG, Dion? You're quite right. Do you have a verdict as to why the 86s were going in? We've seen a lot of theories can we summarise them into what the causes were? Well, my belief is that the aircraft was was directionally unstable as it was originally designed. Um, and the, it was hurriedly flight tested. The, the flight testing wasn't sufficient to pick up that fact. Um, and then when it was encountered in service, people didn't really give it enough weight. We've got to remember too that... Um, uh, flight testing and certification performance of aircraft was not anywhere near as sophisticated then as it is today. So they were still really grappling with problems of how to define stability and control. Um, certification was often a, ma a matter of uh, pilot preference and what they felt about the aircraft. There was no objective measures of a lot of things. So and it was, it was partly the technology of the time and the standards of the time, but also partly the rush to get the aeroplane certified, the political pressure that was behind it that sort of prevented a, a more measured approach being taken, I think. And I picked up, it was a DH-89 Mount Cook was operating. What major improvements happened between the 86 and the 89? Well, the DH-89 was a different aeroplane. Although it did show some features. So the DH-89 also had a single spar outer wing section. Um, and there was never any question over the DH-89 structural integrity. So that was one of the concerns for the DH-86 that actually seems to have not really been um, of any significance. Uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on DH-89, so <laughs> or DH-86s really. Phil, uh, in uh, can you re refresh my memory as to the uh, aircraft that were used at the start of the um, service between Singapore and Brisbane, and what what uh, aircraft were used between December nineteen thirty five, with no th December nineteen thirty four, and the first introduction of the short empire of flying boats. Uh, yeah, well, so for the first couple of months, Qantas used a DH-61 um, and I think a DH-50 or 51 maybe. Um, so some their old fleet, basically, to operate the Brisbane to Darwin section. And Imperial Airways temporarily extended their service to Darwin using their uh, AW-15 Atalantas. And then when the DH-86... Uh, airworthiness, uh, you know, the gentleman's agreement with Qantas had, was lifted and they were able to fly them on passenger services. They took over from uh, early 35 through till 1938. And Qantas seemed to have operated them quite safely uh, during that period. They were, um, you know, they crashed them a few times and, and ripped off wheels and things like that, but they, they never had a major uh, disaster. But they... I think because Lester Brown knew that they were very twitchy and they were very, very careful about training their pilots and about the loading of the aircraft. And I think they learned how to operate them safely, even though they probably were quite marginally stable. 
Well, was there an amendment to the uh, flight manual of the aeroplane after the what appears to be a chronic aft CFG issue was discovered? Um, well, aeroplanes didn't have flight manuals rolling back then, as we oh, know today. <laughs> Sorry? I thought civil aircraft actually had to have it under ICANN and ICAO. Uh, well, there was a flight manual, but it, it wasn't um, any, you know, the sort of thing that you're talking about or, or what we would consider a proper flight manual today. Um, but I think they did amend the loading uh, um, parameters for the aircraft. Certainly, uh, as I said, I know Qantas were very, uh, um, very, uh, what's the word, cognizant of the problems. Um, but you know, I've never come across anything uh, beyond that. And also, as I said, um, when the UK authorities had their their own DH-86 problems later in 1935, uh, they don't seem to have communicated any of that to the Australian authorities. Hey, Phil, uh, it's Kevin. Um, just wondering whether there's any recorded incidents with the, um, once they put those extra fins on the tail. Not that I'm aware of, Kevin. I think that's, that cured the problem, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Okay. And the BA-146 was another British um, aircraft that was... Um, True. <laughs> by a few people. <laughs> True. Okay. Once again, more the exception than the rule. That was probably the last British airliner, really, wasn't it, almost? It certainly appeared that the tail surfaces of the DH-86 was just the same as the DH-84. And with a bigger aeroplane, you think they would have had a larger fin and rudder. And uh, also, how would it have handled with one outer engine inoperative? That would be very interesting to know. You could need a bigger fin and rudder in the first place for that. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And also the um, the additional inertia of the engines further outboard yeah. probably wouldn't have helped either. Um, so there's, I think with the DH-86, they basically scale up the DH-84 in some respects. Um, and that was probably where they, they went wrong. But it was designed in quite a hurry, as I said, to, to meet the tight deadline for the uh, Empire Air Service. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> there you go. Uh, Phil, oh. Remy Barry. Oh, you ready? Can you hear me? Yep. Just, I missed the start of your presentation with the uh, forced landing of, on Hunter Island. Uh, not just thinking about the pilot in command, uh, his uh, decision to, to uh, force land there. Um, how was his uh, career after that? Do you know or not? Uh, yeah, look, Alex Bain went on to a long, successful career, I believe. Um, he's certainly, um, uh, Hollyman's backed him uh, over his decision to force land the aeroplane. And he was well aware of the history of what had happened with the DH-86s in the, the year prior to that, um, as was uh, Ivan Holyman, and, and they um, they supported him. And also Fergus McMaster from Qantas uh, spoke out as well in the media saying, yes, he, he fully supported uh, the decision to uh, do the forced landing, but also to, to suspend the aircraft's type certificate. So, um, you know, people, people knew what had gone before. It wasn't something that occurred in isolation. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thanks. Um, I should probably say too, I think um, this story should be coming out in aviation heritage um, sooner or later. And uh, there'll be a fair bit more detail about the actual accident and the recovery of the passengers and so on. Um, in that story. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So thanks, Phil. That uh, was uh, lived up to expectations. It's uh, utterly fascinating. Just um, there's some film somewhere of the uh, number number one air ambulance in Libya. I was just 
looking for it on my other computer, flying, uh, and they were flying DH... Uh, 86s. 86s, exactly. Yeah. But uh, no, they um, sort of lovely aircraft at the end of a line, weren't they? A beautiful airplane so, to look at, I think. Oh, yeah. And uh, as I said... The uh, Havilland design. Yeah. And uh, my little flight in the Dragon Repeat is one of the great memories. So thanks very much, Phil. That was really, really great. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be worried about out wearing your welcome. You'd be welcome any time. <laughs> oh, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for a very uh, in interesting and um, brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. I thought the photographs were fantastic. Yeah, they are a wonderful collection of photographs. We're very lucky to have them. Yeah. Nice work. Yeah. What's that, Brandon? Nice work. Well done. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. No worries. Mm -hmm. So, all the next one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so as I said, uh, I. Um, do hope that we'll have Michael Smith for the next one, but we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, so just uh, finding um, the, uh, on the on my other computer, uh, I, it take me long, too long to set up, but it's only about uh, 30 seconds of, uh, of um, the DH-89s in Africa. But, but I mean, even getting them there was a huge operation. Okay, so I'll leave the uh, meeting open for the usual gossip and uh, uh, I'll uh, let everybody uh, get back to uh, the football or the election or to uh, the election the football or whatever. <laughs> so uh, so all horrified. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye